The Biodiversity of Spiders, Part 3, Spider Evolution and Diversity. With 48,000 described species, spiders are among the most diverse groups on Earth, ranking seventh in global diversity after the five largest insect orders and Akari among the arachnids. They are almost exclusively predators and play a significant role in the regulation of insect populations. Atercopus was first described as a 386 million year old Devonian spider. This fossil was rather fragmentary, but it included clear evidence of silk spigots. The image here in the upper left shows what is thought to be the oldest strand of silk in the fossil record. Additional fossils and further interpretation revealed that Atercopus was not a spider at all, but belonged to a closely related extinct group called Ur Araneida, characterized by a segmented abdomen, a tail-like flagellum, and silk spigots mounted on abdominal plates rather than on spinnerets. Idmonarachne is another spider relative based on a 305 million year old Carboniferous fossil. It features a segmented abdomen but lacks both spinnerets and a flagellum. Like Ur Araneida, it may have had spigots on the abdomen. Chimerarachne is a remarkable arachnid from the mid-Cretaceous amber. It has a segmented abdomen, well-developed spinnerets with silk spigots, and a long flagellum. The oldest fossil attributable to a living spider group is a mesotheli from the upper Carboniferous, about 298 million years ago, called paleotheli. Like living spiders in this group, it has a segmented abdomen as we and well-developed spinnerets with silk spigots, but lacks a flagellum. The relative ages of Chimerarachne and Paleotheli mean that tailed spider relatives coexisted with primitive spiders for at least 200 million years. The oldest evidence of spiders building prey capture webs that might be familiar to us come from amber trapped in 140 million year old Cretaceous silk. Shown here is a slightly younger specimen that is a bit easier to visualize. Both specimens show silk fibers with more or less evenly spaced gluey droplets, just like modern orb weaving spiders build. Mesotheli are an ancient group of spiders, sister to all remaining spiders. Their oldest appearance in the fossil record dates from the upper Carboniferous. Today, they can be found only in China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. There are about 135 described species. They differ from all other living spiders in having segmented abdomens. They also have the spinnerets placed near the middle of the abdomen rather than at its posterior. They live in burrows with signal lines radiating out, but I think I'll have David Attenborough show you a little bit more about that. Of all the inhabitants of the undergrowth that have exploited silk, none have done so with more variety and skill than the spiders, and this is almost certainly the first way in which they used it. Here on this bank in the Malaysian rainforest, there are strands of silk radiating from this little patch in the middle. Watch what happens if I touch one of them. Can't help jumping. That was a trapdoor spider, but it was so swift. Do you hardly saw it? Let's see if I can get it to do it again. The spider, when hungry, sits close behind the trapdoor. The strands outside are all connected to a silken collar that surrounds the mouth of the hole. Each of her feet is in contact with it. The slightest twitch is enough to tell her that something's moving around outside. A single twitch will produce no reaction. That could be caused by a falling leaf or a drop of water. But a repeated vibration, especially if it moves from one strand to another, could mean prey. Prey like this beetle.
now it'll kill it. This is the most ancient of living spiders. The fact that it has uniquely segmented plates on its back shows that it's more closely related than any other to those pioneer hunters, the scorpions. And like them, it has a powerful venom. Once bitten, its victim has little chance. Our next group of spiders are the megalomorphs. These include the familiar tarantulas, several kinds of trapdoor spiders, and the Sydney funnel web, one of the world's most medically serious spiders. There are about 3,000 species of megalomorphs currently known. Megalomorphs and mesotheli both have two pairs of book lungs, a characteristic shared with other arachnid orders within a clade named for this characteristic, the tetrapulmonata, which also includes the amblypigi, uropigi, and schizomata. In our next group of spiders, the Iranian morphy, the posterior set of book lungs is usually replaced with a set of tracheal tubes. Mesotheli and megalomorphs also have the fangs of their calistri oriented more or less in parallel. In Iraniomorphs, the calistri are rotated so that the fangs oppose each other. This permits a pinching action not possible with parallel fangs, a strike uh, with uh, parallel fangs is more of a lunge. Araniomorphs constitute the vast majority of spider diversity. They are what we might consider typical spiders. Araniomorphs also pioneered the use of sticky silk. Silk in mesothelia and megalomorphs can tangle, but it is basically dry and non-adhesive. The first kind of sticky silk is called cribellate silk. It is basically a wool of very fine fibers combed out from a plate just in front of the spinnerets called a crebellum. That's CR in the scanning electron microscope on the left. A specialized comb of hairs on the fourth leg called a calamistrum is used to draw out the fine silk. The fine wool is formed around a core fiber. Crebellate silk is sticky because its fine fibers are able to get very close to objects, such as the exoskeleton of an insect, to the point that adhesion is achieved through van der Waals and hygroscopic forces. The more typical type of sticky silk evolved later. This is best exemplified by the orb-weaving spiders we saw in the last section and the Cretaceous fossils of silk and amber. E. crebellate silk comes from two triplets of specialized spigots on the posterior lateral spinnerets. That's the PLS in the scanning electron microscope on the right. Two of these spigots lay down a core line with an even coating of gluey silk from the other four spigots. Shortly after the line is laid down, water from the air is absorbed by the gluey silk, which then starts to form more or less evenly spaced sticky droplets. Here is what crebellate and ecrebellate silk look like close up. Here is a spider making crebellate silk. Notice the movement of her fourth legs. She is using her calamistrum to comb out silk from the crebellum. The earliest branches off the araniomorph tree reveal transformations of several key characteristics that set the stage for the great radiations of spider diversity to come. The hypochylidae is a relic araniomorph family. It is unique among araniomorphs in retaining two pair of book lungs, just like megalomorphs and mesotheli. Because of this and other characteristics, it is generally thought to be among the earliest branches in araniomorph evolution. Also during this early stage of araniomorph evolution, major changes to both the female and male genitalia occurred. Female spiders have spermatheci, which they use to store sperm donated by the male during copulation. As she lays her eggs, she fertilizes them with her stored sperm. Primitively, there is a common duct for getting sperm into and out of the spermatheci. This is referred to as the haplogyne condition. During this evolutionary transition period, 
separate specialized sets of ducts, one for copulation and one for fertilization, appeared. This was accompanied by an increase in sclerotization, that is, hardness, and structural complexity. Refer, we refer to this as the entoligyne condition. One of the implications for this entoligyne architecture is that it may allow females to exercise more control. Female spiders will generally mate with more than one male if possible. Entoligyne architecture may permit the female to control which male fertilizes the majority of her eggs. This may be independent of mating order. In the haplogyne condition, the last male to copulate can typically expect to fertilize most of the eggs because his sperm will sit closest to the entrance. At around the same time, there was a corresponding increase in the complexity of the male pedipalp. Primitive male spider pedipalps are not, not much more complicated than a pipette, and the structures have a limited range of movement. But the male pedipalps of entelogyne spiders are surprisingly diverse, featuring inflatable membranes, hydraulic rotating sclerites, and interlocking parts. The first of two major radiations of spiders are the aranioids, the orb weavers and their relatives. The orb web itself has been modified beyond recognition several times over evolutionary history, and most species in this group construct a flat sheet or a, a messy tangle. But even though web architecture varies, the pattern of behaviors used to construct the web are often very similar to those used by orb weavers, and also different from web builders and other spider lineages. The orb weavers and their descendants account for 29% of spider diversity. There is, by the way, another group of orb weavers. These are the crebellate orb weavers. For some time, a compelling hypothesis for how this group evolved postulated that the original orb weaver was crebellate. The crebellum was subsequently lost and replaced with the aranioid sticky silk spigots but large DNA-based phylogenetic studies have generally not supported this hypothesis. A few orb weavers decorate their webs with conspicuous white zigzags. A number of spider groups do this, but only deactive ones. The best known are members of the genus Argiope. These curious structures have been the subject of considerable study, but to, but to date their purpose remains largely elusive. They are called stablamenta, invoking the first idea for what they were for, to stabilize the web. But in fact, they have no such effect. None of the subsequently proposed explanations have enjoyed decisive support from experimental data, and so they remain somewhat mysterious. Since we're on the subject, I wanted to take a moment to talk about another web decorating RGOP species, known around here, I believe, as the wesp spin. This conspicuous species has been noticed expanding its range northward in Europe over the past several decades. This has naturally led to the suggestion that this could be related to global warming. However, it seems to be more complicated than simply that. The expanding populations have both higher genetic diversity and more cold tolerance. The Linophiidae is a large spider family that has abandoned the orb web for a sheet web. Linophiids, by the way, account for about a third of Dutch spider species. The Theridiidae are another important spider family in this group. They generally build a more or less messy three-dimensional tangle. A lot of interesting things happen within the Theridiidae. Maternal care is relatively common here. Maternal care, such as is shown here on the right of the screen, requires a certain amount of tolerance among the young siblings. In some cases, this sibling tolerance extends into adulthood, and this can lead to the evolution of social spiders. Another interesting group in the Theridiidae are the kleptoparasites, the food stealers that live in the webs of other spiders and are so sneaky that they are able to steal food caught by their host. And finally, also in this group, there are the widow spiders. Widow spiders are the second medically important spider I'll mention. They have a neurotoxic venom that can cause severe muscle pain, among other symptoms, lasting several days. But widow spiders are generally not aggressive and fatalities are extremely rare. 
So why are they called widow spiders? Well, obviously because they eat their mates. Here's the big female and the little snack-sized male. I spent some time trying to track down the source of this idea that widow spiders routinely eat their mates, because it's not true. Yes, it happens. Sex among predators can be dangerous. But as far back as I went, all I could find were arachnologists tactfully trying to correct the rumor. And then someone started watching widow spiders in Australia. As it turns out, the Australian widow spider does routinely eat her mate. But here's the twist. He is complicit in his own demise. Mating starts out with the male inserting his pedipalp. To begin with, he is about as far away from her chalicera as possible. But then, during copulation, he performs a somersault, pivoting around his pedipalp anchored inside his mate, and ends up with his abdomen basically in her mouth. There he's pumping his uh, sperm inside. And at this point, she begins, lovingly one might imagine, to eat him. How could such an apparently maladaptive behavior as male suicidal mating evolve? Well, perhaps this is a form of parental effort. Male widow spiders in general live for much shorter time than females, so he won't be around long enough to see the young hatch. So perhaps if the female consumes him, his nutrients will translate into more eggs. This has been investigated and found not to be true. The male is only one to two percent of her mass, not enough of a meal to make a difference. But an alternative hypothesis has been advanced that male sacrifice could increase the number of eggs his sperm ends up fertilizing. A series of observations will help to explain this idea. Females who cannibalize their mates are less receptive to subsequent courting males. Also, the fertilization rate is related to the time engaged in copulation. Finally, the longer copulation lasts, the higher the probability of cannibalism. Let's look at this in terms of costs versus benefits. Female receptivity to subsequent mating is reduced after cannibalism, and the male fertilization rate is likely increased due to long copulation time. The cost to the male is the cutoff of any chance of increasing his paternity by mating with another female. But in the case of these spiders, this may not be much of a cost at all. This is because the male pedipalp is typically damaged during mating. Here is the pedipalp of a male widow spider, which terminates in this long black spiral ribbon. This is the part that is inserted into the female genitalia. Near the tip is a weak point, which typically breaks off during copulation. The tip is left inside the female genitalia. This broken tip, if placed properly, appears to create a plug that inhibits sperm from subsequent males from reaching the spermatheci. It is unlikely that a male that has already gone through mating once would be effective on a second attempt. The Australian widow spider is considered a rare but not unique example of male sacrifice behavior. We move on now to the second major radiation of spiders, cryptically known as the RTA clade. RTA stands for the retrolateral tibial apophysis of the male pedipalp and is a characteristic feature of most members of this group. The RTA clade accounts for more than half of spider diversity. It includes some web builders and lots of webless hunters, some with very good vision. One important member of the RTA clade are the lycosidae, the wolf spiders. Most wolf spiders are actually quite small and not at all intimidating. 
Wolf spiders have a distinctive eye arrangement. Females carry egg sacs attached to their spinnerets. When the young hatch, they crawl onto the back of their mother, where they are protected until their first molt. Curiously, we saw something similar in some other arachnid orders, but this particular form of maternal care is otherwise unique within spiders. Wolf spiders are mostly wandering hunters, but a few mostly tropical groups build webs. Both the wandering and web-building lycosids are three-clawed spiders. Wolf spiders have pretty good vision. During courtship, males signal to females using a combination of visual and vibratory signals. The Pisuridae include the nursery web spiders and the fishing spiders. Fishing spiders are adept at walking on water. They can be quite large and consume both arthropods and vertebrates. Females carry their egg sac under their body. In some species, males will offer a gift of wrapped prey to entice a mate. The Tomicidae are the crab spiders. Some of them can change their color based on a f the flower they are sitting on. These are sit-and-wait ambush predators that specialize on pollinators. Large sporacids are mostly a tropical group, but they occasionally come to the Netherlands with shipments of produce. There are many other lineages within the RTA clade, far too many to go into. So the last RTA clade spider family I'm going to talk to you about today are the Salticity, the jumping spiders. And with over 5,000 described species, they are the largest spider family. Salticids have a distinctive eye arrangement and excellent vision. Jumping spiders engage in elaborate and distinctive courtship displays. Here are some examples. Also among the jumping spiders are the peacock spiders, which you have probably encountered on the internet. They are really colorful, really tiny, and they sure can dance. There are more to discover. Seven species were just described in a paper earlier this year. Within just the last few years, an ambitious phylogenetic study on spiders was published. It featured 923 spider species sequenced for six mitochondrial and nuclear markers. Some of what I talked to you about today came from this study. In 1999, some colleagues and I went to a remote forest site in southern Guyana. We arrived by small plane on an unimproved airstrip near a village of Waiwai Amerindians. We loaded up dugout canoes and floated up river to a plot of forest that would be our home for the next two weeks. We used a variety of sampling methods to collect all the spiders we could find. We found big spiders like this one, tiny spiders like this one, the average spider species is just under three millimeters in total body length, some strange looking spiders like this one. All in all, we spent 300 hours collecting 6,000 adult spiders from this one hectare plot. These comprised about 350 species. We counted the number of individuals for each of these 350 species in our samples. What we found is that most spider species in this forest were very rare and only a few species had very high abundances. Nearly a third of the spiders we found were represented in our samples by only a single individual. 
This fits with an almost ubiquitous pattern that we find in tropical biodiversity. Rare is common, and common is rare. What does it mean that there are so many rare species in our samples? For one thing, it means that there is still a lot of biodiversity for us to discover just in this one plot, and we could keep sampling for a long time and still encounter rare species we hadn't seen before. We estimate that the true number of species in this plot was about 700. Here in the Netherlands, biodiversity is not quite so overwhelming. 675 species of spiders are known for the Netherlands. The Dutch spider community is dominated by the sheet-weaving Linifeidae. Theridiids are well represented. The major orb-weaving families are the Araneidae and the Tetradophidae. The most diverse RTA clade families are the Salticidae, Lycosidae, and Tumicidae. Normally, on a course like this, we would have a practical exercise involving spider identification. This starts with field work. We always use ethanol as a preservative, and we always make permanent labels to keep with the specimen containing information about where it was collected, when, and by whom. Next, you need to get familiar with spider anatomy. There is a very good guide in Dutch for the spiders of the Netherlands. There is also the World Spider Catalog, an indispensable online resource for spider taxonomists. Place spiders in a dish of alcohol and examine it under a dissecting microscope. Make sure there is enough alcohol in your dish that the spider doesn't break the surface because this creates visual distortions. You might want to put some sand in your dish to allow you to place the spider in just the right way. Thank you for your attention.